Merci d'être des nôtres. Pour ce webinaire du comité consultatif de l'UPU, j'ai le plaisir d'être l'animateur de cette réunion aujourd'hui. Nous avons avec nous M. Walter Tezek, président du comité consultatif de l'UPU. Merci d'être des nôtres. Nous avons également un certain nombre de partenaires externes que je remercie. Nicolas Loufrani, PDG de The Smiley Company. Une des 50 entreprises les plus importantes du marché, donc merci beaucoup d'être là. Nous avons également Anthony Harris, le directeur des timbres et objets à collectionner de New Zealand Post, et Matthew Parks également, qui est le directeur timbres et objets à collectionner de Royal Mail Group. Je vous propose de commencer sans plus tarder. Et donc, Nicolas, je vous donne la parole. Vous allez pouvoir vous présenter et vous allez pouvoir nous parler de tout ce que vous avez fait dans le cadre de votre société de Smiley Company. C'est à vous. Merci beaucoup, Benjamin. C'est un véritable plaisir d'être là. Euh, j'étais philatéliste quand j'étais enfant. Et euh, donc, euh, je suis très fan de la philatélie. Je vais vous parler de ce que nous avons fait, notamment dans le cadre de la euh, campagne du 50e anniversaire qui a été lancée au niveau mondial. Et donc, nous l'avons fait en collaboration avec euh, La Poste. Tout d'abord, Smiley, ça a été créé par mon père en 1972. Et le message, c'était Smiley, euh, le bonheur. Et donc, il s'agissait de mettre en relief les nouvelles positives dans les euh, journaux. Et donc, par la suite, c'est devenu un véritable phénomène dans le monde entier. En 1997, euh, sur la base du smiley de mon père, eh j'ai commencé à créer beaucoup d'émoticônes avec différents objets pour remplacer euh, du texte et donc pour euh, rendre le monde numérique plus vivant. Et donc, euh, nous avons lancé cette euh, activité dans le monde entier. Donc, en 2022, nous avons lancé le 50e anniversaire de Smiley. Nous avons repris le message de Smiley dans beaucoup de langues et nous avons également euh, lancé la campagne sur beaucoup de marchés. Donc, on a pu contacter des milliards de consommateurs dans le monde entier. Et donc, nous avons lancé cette campagne en collaboration avec euh, des marques. Donc, nous avons... Euh, ouvert euh, des, des centaines de boutiques euh, Smiley. Nous collaborons avec différentes marques dans le domaine euh, de la mode, du luxe, différentes catégories. Nous avons plus de 25 000 boutiques. Nous avons des collaborations nombreuses. Nous avons euh, généré plus de 30 milliards euh, d'impressions avec plus de 250 influenceurs euh, qui ont... Euh, fait passer le message à plus de 240 millions de followers. Donc, c'était une très belle campagne qui nous a permis de renforcer notre notoriété de 50 Et c'est la campagne la plus réussie pour ce qui est du... Euh, secteur des euh, marques et des licences. Et donc, si vous voulez, c'était euh, euh, un véritable succès. La campagne a été lancée donc, début 2002 à Shanghai et nous avons mis le logo Smiley et le message en chinois. Donc, euh, il était présent plus de 200 influenceurs. Et euh, ensuite, euh, comme on était en période de COVID, eh bien, on ne l'a fait qu'en Chine à l'époque. 
Et pour ce qui est des autres régions, bien, je vous en parlerai tout à l'heure. Et euh, le premier soir, eh bien, il y a eu aussi une campagne du Nouvel An avec David Guetta à Abu Dhabi. C'était au Louvre de Abu Dhabi pour le réveillon du Nouvel An. Donc, il y avait des centaines de millions de personnes en ligne. Et euh, il y avait aussi le message de Smiley, euh, prenez le temps de sourire. Ensuite, euh, nous avons également mené une campagne d'affiches, de, de posters. Et ça a été fait dans les principales capitales du monde, euh, Paris, Londres, Barcelone, Amsterdam, Copenhague. Donc, c'était des grandes villes et le message a été traduit dans différentes langues. Et donc, euh, il y a eu ensuite des, des, des campagnes menées avec des influenceurs, avec des vidéos. Et donc, il s'agissait de propager le bonheur dans les rues et de faire passer le message qui avait été écrit par mon père. Donc, il s'agit de transmettre le bonheur et la positivité. Et si vous voulez, c'est un peu la valeur de base de la marque Smiley d'origine. Et donc, ça a créé beaucoup de buzz dans les médias. Et ensuite, et comme on a fait en Chine le 1er janvier, eh bien, on a organisé une journée internationale du bonheur au mois de mars. Et donc, il y a eu des projections du smiley sur des façades et des monuments dans le monde entier. Le Guggenheim à New York, euh, au Danemark, un peu partout dans le monde. La journée internationale du bonheur était consacrée à l'Ukraine. Et donc, nous avons mis un smiley en bleu et en jaune. Et on a également euh, ensuite aidé un certain nombre d'organisations caritatives en euh, Ukraine dans le cadre de cette campagne. Et là, vous avez quelques photos d'influenceurs euh, qui euh, sont en train de prendre des photos dans le cadre euh, de notre campagne de street art. Ensuite, nous avons également collaboré avec euh, Asuline Publishing. C'est une maison d'édition française très connue dans le monde. Et nous avons également célébré 50 ans de bonnes nouvelles à la maison Assouline au centre de Londres. Et nous avons également insisté sur beaucoup de choses positives connues depuis 50 ans. Et donc, c'est toujours dans le cadre du message positif inventé par mon père pour propager les bonnes nouvelles. Donc, nous avons lancé des collaborations avec différentes marques. Voilà, par exemple, ce que nous avons fait dans le domaine de la mode, voilà, pour des accessoires. Donc, ça, ça fait partie du merchandising de la marque Smiley. Et nous avons également fait une montre avec Richard Mille. C'est une montre à 1,2 million de dollars. Il y a une édition collector limitée à 50 exemplaires. Et donc, ça a créé un buzz incroyable. Donc, si vous voulez, c'est le produit Smiley le plus cher jamais fabriqué. Et on a également collaboré avec de grands magasins, avec des partenaires détaillants. Et donc, il y avait des produits Smiley partout. Et là, vous avez la galerie Lafayette, Boulevard Haussmann, mais il y en a également à Dubaï, à Shanghai, dans différentes villes. Et donc, euh, il y avait la marque Smiley présente partout. Ensuite, nous avons également euh, créé euh, un parcours euh, artistique pour enseigner les émotions visuelles aux enfants, pour leur faire comprendre euh, ce qu'est une émotion. Et donc, euh, ça a été fait un peu partout en Europe. Et il y a eu également la collection Bicester. 
Et donc, euh, il y a eu euh, des pop-up qui ont été ouverts dans 11 villages dans le monde entier. Ensuite, euh, nous avons également eu une collaboration avec la République française. Ça, c'est très important. C'est avec la Poste et la Monnaie de Paris. Et il y a eu un concours, c'est-à-dire une collection de timbres. Nous avons fait fabriquer 36 millions de timbres dans, dans toute la France. Il y a eu un prix qui a été décerné également dans le cadre de cette collection de timbres, une collection de timbres qui tourne autour des émoticônes. Et donc, Ici, vous avez les différents émoticônes avec des timbres très colorés. Et là aussi, c'était une campagne très réussie. Et donc, là, vous avez l'événement de lancement avec le président de la Poste. Et euh, vous avez le trophée 2022 à gauche. Ensuite, avec la monnaie de Paris, nous avons également collaboré. Nous avons fait fabriquer des pièces, des pièces en argent. Donc, c'est un produit qui a très bien marché. Nous avons également euh, fabriqué des médailles avec euh, le Smaillet, mais également avec Royal Dutch Mint, qui a créé une pièce euh, en faveur d'une banque alimentaire à Amsterdam. Donc, euh, c'est un programme qu'on peut faire, un projet qu'on peut faire avec des organisations caritatives. Donc, ça a été fait aux Pays-Bas. Maintenant, pour ce qui est de la philanthropie, en 2022, nous avons également euh, lancé la Charity Film Awards. C'est euh, une campagne pour des films fondés sur une cause. Donc, il s'agit euh, d'organisations du secteur caritatif. C'est un prix que nous avons chaque année. Il y a eu 315 candidats qui ont participé en 2022, 2024, 526. Et donc, ça a généré des dizaines de millions de vues. Et donc, ça permet de, de, de regrouper notamment des, des donateurs euh, qui peuvent euh, contribuer pour euh, apporter leur soutien à des organisations caritatives qui font euh, bouger les choses dans le monde entier. En 2027, eh bien, il y aura un autre anniversaire. Ce sera le 30e anniversaire du Smiley, des émoticônes originelles euh, qui ont changé à jamais la communication entre les gens. Et donc, ce sera une autre euh, campagne de masse. Il y aura beaucoup de collaborations, de partenariats avec des influenceurs, beaucoup de relations publiques. Donc, ça aura un impact important sur la culture mondiale. Et donc, j'espère que vous serez nombreux à vous joindre à nous, notamment pour créer des collections de timbres et aussi pour être, pour être là pour collaborer avec ceux qui sont intéressés. Voilà donc euh, ce que je voulais vous dire dans ma présentation. Je reste à votre disposition si vous avez des questions. Merci beaucoup, Nicolas. Collaboration impressionnante et euh, en effet, il y a énormément de marques euh, qui se sont jointes à vous pour euh, renforcer encore votre visibilité mondiale. Euh, je ne peux qu'imaginer euh, l'effet de cette campagne. Et maintenant, je voudrais donner la parole à Walter Trizek, qui est le président le comité consultatif de l'UPU, il a certainement des questions à vous poser. Walter, c'est à vous. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Benjamin. Nicolas, c'est une très belle présentation, très impressionnante. En effet, ma première question est la suivante. Le groupe La Poste a sorti ou en fait a mis en place cette collaboration. Et qu'est-ce que cela vous amène Et quelle est la valeur ajoutée que cela apporte à votre marque Est-ce que ça renforce votre crédibilité Donc, euh, qu'en pensez-vous Bien, tout d'abord, c'est une grande fierté, euh, comme à chaque fois, de collaborer avec euh, une société comme La Poste. Comme vous le savez, Vous le savez, si vous voulez, la Poste, si vous voulez, ce n'est pas commercial, c'est le service public, c'est le gouvernement. 
Et donc, nous sommes très heureux d'avoir une collaboration de marque avec des sociétés privées. Mais quand on parle avec le gouvernement, avec le service public, il n'y a pas d'aspect commercial. C'est-à-dire que ça ne nous rapporte pas d'argent. Donc, la Poste ou la Monnaie de Paris n'ont pas payé de royalties à notre société. Donc, il ne s'agit pas de générer des revenus. Nous le faisons, si vous voulez, pour des euh, questions de, de, de fierté, de crédibilité, pour montrer que nous avons une importance culturelle. Parce que avec les timbres, vous savez, il y a des personnages importants, des artistes, Picasso, Dali ou d'autres, qui figurent sur les timbres. Donc, pour moi, c'est peut-être parce que je viens d'une certaine génération, mais en tout cas, j'ai beaucoup de respect pour le timbre en tant qu'objet culturel. Yeah. Um, I'm looking very much forward to, uh, to the next presentations when we hear from designated operators who are the um, for, further collaborate uh, with different brands. But Benjamin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Uh, I, I think uh, we can already see the interest uh, that it uh, may run uh, at an institutional level when we go from a government perspective, uh, uh, as you said, Nicolas. Um, and, and I trust that some of our designated operators has already started this way with, with a lot of success. And I'd like to welcome uh, my dear colleague Anthony Harris from the New Zealand uh, Postal Corporation uh, to share with us also all, all the great job which has already been there. Thank you very Anthony, much. the floor is yours. I will just share my screen. It, it, uh, it's still saying it's disabled. Yeah, it's currently saying I, I can't share my screen. Okay, Nicola, can you uh, deactivate your screen share, please? Yes. Anthony. There we go. Perfect. Let's try it again. Oh, how's that look? <laughs> see, see my screen okay? Perfectly fine. And just for the audience, uh, sorry, if it's not necessarily the, 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 the way that uh, all, all webinar has run, but going through so much visibility and so much uh, beautiful products needs to be to be seen more yes. than less. anyway thank you very much benjamin i I'm, i really appreciate you uh, inviting uh, me to present uh, my name's anthony harris i'm the head of stamps collectibles for uh, new zealand post just a little bit about um, stamps collectibles we're we're we've got an interesting setup we we set up as kind of a, a, a small semi-autonomous function as part of New Zealand Post and we set up in a way where we're supported to be quite innovative and agile like a small business and we get a lot of autonomy so we have end-to-end -end, um, responsibility for idea generation design production marketing e-commerce customer fulfillment and we make for New Zealand we make stamps we make coins on behalf of the Reserve Bank and uh, more recently we're, we're expanding into other new types of products and gifts look our strategy over the last a um, few years is given that stamps and mail are declining uh, is to really focus on growing our e-commerce channel. Um, we've, we're producing probably about one third of our stamps uh, with licensing that's very uh, closely linked back to New Zealand and also to try and expand uh, the range of products that we're doing. So everything we do links back to our, our purpose um, and that's really Uh, um, we need to produce very high quality product, whatever we do, uh, and it all needs to reflect New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand's people, its culture, our history, our heritage, our natural environment. And of course, it, it's 
it enhances the New Zealand Post brand and, and it can be a valuable source of, of revenue. Um, ultimately, profitability can be important, but our ultimate goal is uh, whatever we do needs to link strongly back to New Zealand and tell a story about New Zealanders and New Zealand on the world stage. Um, in terms of our, our strategy, like why do, why do licensing? Uh, on stamps and coins and other products. And it's really to attract a broader audience. Um, you'll get, if you do something like Lord of the Rings, you'll get existing collectors that are excited by that, but you'll get the, the whole fan base of the, the franchise coming in. Um, it's also an opportunity to promote culture and tourism. Um, you know, Lord of the Rings, again, um, uh, has resulted in a lot of tourism for New Zealand. Um, and celebrating these types of licenses is a real opportunity to promote the New Zealand culture and New Zealand achievements. Um, often customers will see branding as a, 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 a collectible um, and that can result in quick sellouts, um, long-term value uh, appreciation for the collector and obviously revenue generation for, for the business and um, you know sometimes licensing can attract premium pricing, which is which is good for um, boosting sales. But the but the biggest point that I'd like to make for us is that we're very passionate about whatever we put on a stamp uh, for licensing still needs to be very very strongly uh, connected back to New Zealand. So I'd just like to go through some uh, recent examples of the licensing that we've done. The first one. I'm sure you'll all be aware of is Lord of the Rings. So we've got a long uh, history uh, and relationship with the Lord of the Rings franchise. We put uh, our, we put out our first Lord of the Rings stamp 23 years ago before the first movie came out. Now that at that time we we may have very well been the first country in the world to put licensing on a stamp, especially a movie. Um, New Zealand seen as the home of Middle Earth. It was the very start of. Uh, the growth in the New Zealand film industry, which is now very mature. Um, and these images here, we wanted to do something special for the 20th anniversary. So instead of just putting an image from the film, we got a, an artist called Sasha Lees, who's, who's a famous New Zealand portrait artist, to redraw some of the scenes. That made it more special. It made it uh, longer to get approval because we had to get the actors to approve everything. But we, we felt that that made it... Um, uh, uh, special for the 20th anniversary and it was a good opportunity to promote the artist as well. Um, Avatar, Way of the Water, um, both Avatar movies have been filmed in New Zealand. Um, they're some of the uh, biggest selling movies of all time. Um, there, had, there wasn't a lot of merchandising allowed for Avatar, Way of the Water. Um, we were the only country that could produce uh, stamps and coins because of the connection with New Zealand. Uh, we were working with Lightstorm uh, before the movie was released to do the imagery. And again, for us, this is about the opportunity and the privilege to promote um, New the New Zealand film industry, uh, what James Cameron is doing. He lives in New Zealand. Um, and it brings in another, uh, a broader range of pop culture fan base. And it's interesting, the, um, the, the Avatar fan base is not quite as uh, fanatical as the Lord of the Rings fan base is. Harry McCleary is a really famous uh, New Zealand children's book, which is now 40 years old. Uh, it's very much captured the hearts and minds of many children, children that have now grown up, parents that read it to their children. We worked with the artist, Lindley Dodd and, and um, Penguin Books. Uh, Lindley Dodd signed everything off. Uh, we were delighted to work with her and we celebrated her as a New Zealander. Uh, and we stuck very closely to the original artwork from the books. And again, a different audience, a lot of children, a lot of young people, a lot of parents that had read the book, book to their children. And, and the book had reasonable exposure internationally. And I think there's, a, a, you know, there was reasonable exposure in the US and the UK. Um, now music, New Zealand music. Um, Split Ends was is, is a New Zealand band from the 80s, 70s and 80s. True Colours was... Uh, a very uh, popular album internationally. Split Ends were probably the first band to um, uh, break seriously into the international music scene from New Zealand. Out of Split Ends came a band called Crowded House. I don't know if you're aware of them. Um, but again, we, we worked with the band to get sign-off for this. 
um, and uh, a lot of it's just been released this month. A lot of interest from again a new customer base, New Zealand music fans, um, and it's something that we want to do probably once a year is, is is link into New Zealand music that's been successful on the on the world stage. Another thing that's uh, important to New Zealand is our gaming industry, and that's emerged over the last few years um, as uh, we're really kind of punching above our weight internationally and in making games. And so we celebrated five recent New Zealand games that have done quite well in the international market. And we coordinated with those gaming companies. Um, and the fan, the fan bases were really excited. We did some other products outside of stamps and coins. And um, yeah, a lot of a lot of the young people that are gaming saw this as very retro and quite liked it. Um, but the yeah, but the New Zealand game industry is doing well on the world stage, and um, it's a government strategy to support its growth. And the last one, which is another long-standing license for us, is New Zealand rugby. So the All Blacks and our, our women's team, the um, the Black Ferns. Um, successful on the world uh, stage, uh, international champions at, at, at various times. Uh, so of strong national significance to us. Uh, and it's been wonderful recently to, to um, support our women's team. Um, this is an easy brand to work with. We've worked for them a long time. There's a, there's a lot of trust there. And yeah, again, it brings in sports fans and people interested in rugby from New Zealand and, and around the world. And that, hopefully I've stuck to my 12 minutes, Benjamin. That's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Sorry, Benjamin, I think you're muted. Yes, thank you, sorry. Uh... Uh, thank you, Anthony. And, and uh, I was just uh, saying that uh, despite all the amazing opportunities through the, the New Zealand history uh, and, and, and promotion, uh, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one dying to know all was, was those impact on your own business model. But I let Walter, as a CC chair, come back to it. And I'm sure having uh, some pertinent questions as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Anthony, congratulations. I think, I think this is a wonderful example um, how a designated operator with a clear focus serving its country um, is moving into uh, merchandising and even further promoting its country by uh, targeted um, specialities attracting um, the, the global audience. This is, this is a, a, a beautiful example. Um, it gives a lot of thought um, to the UPU environment and also the wider postal sector players. Do you, do you think that your model uh, can be upscaled to a global scale? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, you know, New, Zeal New Zealand's a, a small country, so we are, we are kind of unique in, in that perspective. Uh, five million people, but in theory, it could it could work anywhere. I mean, for us, it's about um, creating an innovative environment um, where the, the collectibles business or stamp business, in term in terms of what the um, what goes on a stamp and can draw on a new audience, uh, can be done in quite an agile and innovative way. But also. It, it would very with licensing it would be very easy to lose your way in the sense of putting things on your product that maybe doesn't have quite the strong connection that um that it should have with your country that that's the way we see it so we're very uh hard on ourselves to make sure that, you know if we're going to have a license it's it's got to it's got to first and foremost be something that's very strongly connected with uh with new zealand um, and when you do that, I think the your 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 local uh, population will get on board with it because the connection with the with the franchise and what's important to the country, people will get on board with. Um, and and same with um, with the international audience that may be interested in that licensing. But yeah, 
Yeah, well, thank you very much. I mean, this, this gives us a lot of thought. And um, of course, I mean, we have a certain target and I will present that um, at the end of this presentation. So with that, I would like to give it back to Benjamin um, for our next presenter, hopefully. Thank Th you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. And indeed, the, uh, the stamp itself, just to reduce it, is an incredible vector of communication. Um, allow me, Anthony, to do a, a little parallel in, uh, from uh, one of your cousins, despite the Maori culture that you so brightly put forward. Uh, I guess that uh, in English were kind of some cousins arriving in history soon to use, which leads me uh, directly to Matthew from Rail Mail. Hello, good, good morning, everyone. Or afternoon now, isn't it? Just um, so um, yeah, we've been we've been doing uh, we've been doing this for a long time now. Special stamps for over fifty years, um, and uh, there's been a lot of changes over time. I think just to that point about how special stamps are, how special special stamps are. Um, one thing that always stands in my mind is um, London 2012, so the Olympics, which was just a huge event in the UK. And um, the first gold medal that was won by British people at the Olympics was the women's rowing. And so these ladies had just gone over the line. They they trained all their lives. They'd won a gold Olympic medal. And the first thing they said was, oh, my God, we're going to be on a stamp. <laughs> so, so that was uh you know quite the thing and you do still get that and regardless of the fact we've been doing it for 50 years the media are always excited when a new stamp comes out so it's um you know but content i can't stress it enough content is so important for maintaining for lastly for maintaining special stamp programs in the long term and what i wanted to do with my presentation and i'll just start sharing my screen now and hopefully uh this will work okay uh, can you see that okay, Benjamin? That's showing. Uh, not yet. Wrong screen, maybe. You can't see the raw mail? No, logo? we see you. Uh, maybe if you are using a double screen, share the, the other one. That's strange. We tried this before, didn't we? And it worked. Hang on. Um, that's odd. Uh, again. What's wrong with that? That Perfect. should work. Brilliant. Okay, excellent. I'm going to start the slideshow and hopefully you will now see a pillar box. Okay, you can see that all right? It will do. It will do. It Brilliant. Right. Okay, fantastic. All right, well, before I start, I'm going to do a little case study on something we did a year or so ago. But before I do, I wanted to start with the problem that we were trying to solve because we didn't sort of start off going, let's expand how we look at content. We were trying to fix a problem. And it's a problem that I'm sure a number of people on, on the call who are joining will have either faced or are currently facing. And that was that our traditional philatelic market, it's in structure, it was in structural decline because we've all got this leaky bucket where people are closing their regular customer accounts, these valuable customers, and, and many of them sadly passing away as the market's ages. Um, and so we were losing revenue every year. And when I joined the business in 2015, um, we ran some numbers, we looked at the trends, and we worked out that if we didn't pivot our strategy, we didn't change something in this business, the profits that we were making in 2015 would have halved by 2021. And that didn't happen. And it didn't happen fundamentally because we changed how we looked at content, but also how we looked at the market and how we looked at how we sold things and who we sold them to. We looked at our sales windows. We looked at customer bases. We changed some uh, retail solutions and we put some stamps on sale for longer. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So ultimately, we, we, we developed five pillars. Number one was increasing the revenue by increasing what we call spot buys. And this is people coming in to buy a stamp or a set of stamps because they're into that particular property. Um, effectively, we stopped trying to persuade children to become stamp collectors because the world has changed. And certainly in the UK, the world has changed. People don't collect by format anymore. They collect by brand or by genre. So there was a time when somebody would collect all the stamps or all the coins or even all the bottle tops. That's not really the world we live in anymore. So we stopped doing that. We went after people based on the brands. 
we try to stem the attrition of our regular collectors and we do that through having a very balanced program and actually by releasing products that philatelists and completists won't necessarily be interested in so we're not trying to get existing customers to spend more money we're getting money from different customers um continuing to deliver those high margins whilst getting content in uh, and then two things, and this is what's incredibly important in the UK for stamps, and I'm sure it's the same in other territories as well, which is to drive the lion's share of the positive PR that Royal Mail gets, so much of the column inches that, that Royal Mail gets month in, month out. It's about the stamp programme, or it's about the brands that we've joined up with, and I'll come on to that in a little bit as well. The final piece being awareness of special stamps, which is not quite the same thing. Um, we sort of recognised in 2015 that we were doing all this amazing stuff, but unless people were familiar with stamp programmes and special stamp programmes, they didn't necessarily know we did it. I went to America at Easter um, uh, to Orlando to a Star Wars convention to promote our Star Wars stamps, you can see behind me up here. Um, and there were British people coming up to the stand saying, I didn't know that you'd done these. These are Star Wars fans. who were such Star Wars fans that they had travelled all the way to America on a bank holiday weekend, just queue up to go into a convention. And even they didn't know we'd done Star Wars stamps. So I think sometimes we tell ourselves we're all over the press. Not everybody reads the press. So we had to do something different. We had to change it. It worked. Um, and really what we've seen is we've plugged that leaky bucket with different types of content and different types of products that we're selling through different um, channels. So, the web, what these graphs show you here is, is the last few stamps that we've done, and they're only done by percentages, they're not volumes. And the green bit is the web, that's our web shop. So this is outside of the post office, this is our direct sales, outside of outside of traditional markets. The, so the, the yellow, the blue, and the red are, um, you know, are, are philatelic traders, there are regular subscription customers, there are people who phone up or still write in to get their stamps. The web channel, our web shop is the green. And that, in 2015, you'd be lucky to get over 10% of sales. Now, it can be up to half of them. So it's an extraordinary growth area. And what we're doing on the web is we're selling different types of products, products that aren't of interest to a stamp collector, like some of these things behind me here, the frame stamps, the frame prints, and those kind of things. Um, and, and that is where the growth has come from. Um, and... Uh, Nicola men mentioned earlier about the sort of the prestige of being on a stamp. We have found that over time, you know, you do sometimes have to pay for content. You do. Um, but if you look at the, some of the examples on the right there, I can't sort of share the actual um, financial numbers. But Legend of Robin Hood, which we did in April of last year, Le Le Legend of Robin Hood, um, a very standard stamp issue, such as, you know, Britain's favourite steam trains or flora and fauna, those kind of things, that would make in revenue x million pounds something like warhammer Discworld, paddington sort of mid-tier brands will do twice that but a harry potter or a spice girls will do at least three times that. so it is worth spending on content where it's appropriate and the way that we sort of work that out is we don't we don't it, we don't interfere with postal revenue so if we do pay a fee for content it will be linked to how much we think we're going to make out of the products rather than the stamps. And that's how that tends to work. Um, so we have an optimized stamp program. Similar to what Anthony was saying, I'd say about a third of our stamp issues now are more commercialized subjects. Um, and we have about 15 of them a year. The reason that we do that, and many postal operators do things differently, is we find that every three to four weeks, you get a media peak and social media, the press, the TV, et cetera, get excited by what we're doing. And we do that every three weeks. If we do it more frequently, we don't get the right, we, we, we sort of start losing coverage on some of the stamps that we've got. But we did recognise that we needed to take a less risk averse approach to our content decision making. And slightly differently, actually, to what, to what Anthony was saying you do in New Zealand. We, our focus now is very much on something being a British passion. There's been a subtle move from it having to be totally British to something that the British are passionate about. We were able to do Star Wars initially because um, uh, it was filmed in the UK and made a huge contribution to the British film industry. But over time, we have done other things where perhaps the link is not quite as overt um, and it's still working for us and people are still quite happy with us doing that. Well, certainly we're, 
we're, we're, we're finding that. And I think sometimes we were telling ourselves we couldn't do things when actually we could. Um, so content is incredibly important, but not just content, but um, also the execution. The two golden rules in licensing, and I'm sure Nicola will agree with this, are um, the content and the execution. So what it looks like, what you do with it. We don't use people's style guides, which it can come as quite a shock to a Disney or a Warner Brothers, because everything we do is a work of art. And our sweet spot is either to have a beautiful stamp or have something beautiful that is a work of art that can go on your wall. So I wanted to talk very briefly about Transformers, which is something that we did in uh, 2022. Um, I was incredibly successful for us. I talked about execution. Transformers, multi-billion dollar brand uh, for Hasbro. Um, but do the people who go and see those movies that make billions of dollars, are they going to want pictures of stamps on their walls? Well, no, possibly not. What we went for was a very specific market which was people who read the comics and watched the cartoons in the 80s. They grew up with it. So we went with this very retro approach and we went to Hasbro and said, look, we want to do something totally different with this. They bought into it. So that was great. So the people who designed these stamps were the people who, who drew the comics back in the 80s and it's all new artwork. So it was very much aimed at that core base. And actually the, the market for people who were into Transformers in the 80s isn't, it's not a Marvel comics. But it did Marvel Comics levels of sales because of the way we treated it, because we 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 picked a property where there is that inbuilt base of people. I think Anthony touched on this as well. You know, if you pick content where you, there is an accessible and addressable customer base, that's where it really works. And the execution of the products. So these products I'm showing here. Um, this is a stamp ingots, which is a a metal um, limited edition, and on the right is a reproduction of a, a comic from the UK from 1987 uh, with Optimus Prime stamps on it. That's not something that's of interest to a philatelist or a stamp collector because there's, there's nothing unique about it from a stamp perspective. But it is interesting to somebody who read that comic in the 80s and, and they might want to put that on their wall. So you can see there's different kinds of product categories that have really started resonating with people. And I should say with Transformers, actually, you might think, where's the UK link there? Well, actually, the comic in the UK was enormous in the 80s. Those comic writers went over to the US, wrote for Marvel Comics in the US, and they became famous comic people and kind of changed the comic industry in many ways. So we did have a very good story with that too. Mm. And we tried to do something different. Now, you can put bits of moon rock in stamps, you can do special finishes, but we thought, does that really make, does that really get the cut through to the same extent? So what we tried was augmented reality. And if you scan the app, you download the Royal Mail, Sorry, scan the QR code, download the Royal Mail app. And if you shone the phone over the stamp, let's Optimus Prime there. Optimus Prime would appear in a clip from the original 1980s cartoon and would transform in front of your eyes. Um, and that just got lots of excitement from the fan community because we thought, well, let's get the comic and the cartoon, put them together. You've covered all bases. But we thought, how do we launch this? Well, we went to a convention and we launched it on stage. We didn't sell anything at the convention. Um, because we thought the thing to do, let's let's announce this on stage at a convention in a room full of people who are obsessed with Transformers before it's even gone out to the media. So it's the first time anyone's going to see these things. So up there, that's me with the host uh, about to show the crowd the stamp and the transformation that it does. And they went absolutely bananas. On the left hand side, we had the artist signed special limited editions. And that limited edition sold at auction for charity. It was a one-off, which we could do because there was no stamp on it. It's just the artwork for uh, two and a half thousand pounds. You know, amazing. We got all the guys who got involved in, 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 in the product and who wrote the copy. They're all, you know, kind of famous within the Transformers world. They're all British to talk about the, the sort of development of the stamps. And what happened was, uh, and this is the sort of thing that happens when you do this kind of thing, there was a, a, a news journalist at the BBC who happened to see the press release that just came out after we'd done this, um, while we were still on stage, actually, um, at the BBC. I said, oh, that's fantastic. There happened to be someone looking over his shoulder who was a major journalist at the uh, news journalist at the BBC who was a, happened to be a Transformers fan. Next thing you know, we were front page of BBC News and then all the media picked it up and it absolutely flew and as a result we got 59 million media impressions now the cost because we were giving that convention something you know a, a world first the cost of doing that launch was my hotel room for the night because it was in Birmingham 
that was it. And we got 59 million impressions off the back of that. So you can really leverage um, a, a lot of um, a lot of of, um, of of stuff from that. And I, th I think just going back to my initial point is, you know, people buy brands, not formats these days. And, 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 and that's why we've stepped away from, you know, as I say, getting new collectors. But what you do find is, of course, we've issued Transformers. We'd previously done Marvel Comics. The people who come in and buy these see what else we've done and they buy more as well. And what we um, what I hadn't touched on was the big change, two big changes that we made, one of which was um, if 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 stamps are within a frame and they're affixed to something else, so you can't pull them off because the glue is very strong. Um, we treat those as they're no longer mint stamps. They're no longer valid for postage. And by doing that, that means if you want to get into other retail chains, you can sell your products at a higher margin because you can charge any price. You can have £100 worth of stamps on there. They're not going to be used for postage. You don't have to charge £100 for it. So you can sort of start playing with those different things. And then finally, and I know I'm running out of time, sorry, I'm talking really quickly. The final point <laughs> I wanted to make was um, the big change that we made was we, we acknowledged that we all have a secondary market, right, where we, we issue stamps and then further down the track, dealers, philatelists, collectors sell them on. And there's that secondary market. And so we stop. Selling, we used to stop selling stamps after a year. They'd all get pulped. When I came in and I come from an entertainment licensing background, a new Doctor Who had just started. Don't they always? I think it was um, Peter Capaldi at the time. And I said, let's re-promote our, our Doctor Who stamps and do loads of frames and, you know, all these different things and everything else. And... Um, and they said, well, uh, we've already deleted them. We've already pulled them. I, 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 quite frankly, I couldn't believe it. So um, so what uh, what we decided was, and we didn't have to do this. I was kind of being a little bit nice about it, I guess. But we we, we sat down at a stamp show with um, the philatelic dealers, with the traders, key philatelists, and things like that. And, and we said, look, we've got stamps like Star Wars. That keep on selling and selling and selling for us in the in the in the collectible market and then the, that's new um you're not particularly interested in those because we've printed millions of them so they're not as collectible the ones that are the most collectible for you are the ones such as an anniversary or uh you know the one-off uh legend of robin Hood, the royal issues those kind of things that maybe we will sell for a month and then sales will clear off the clip so how about we give you those earlier than a year and We'll keep on sale for longer, the ones that are more interest to us. And that's what we did. And everybody was quite happy with it. We actually had Star Wars uh, on sale for, for five years in the end. And same with Marvel Comics. And um, <laughs> excuse me. And uh, that's really uh, been, it made a huge difference to us because you have this long tail. You have this background sales. The basket of goods now for somebody coming in to buy a Transformers stamp because they might have bought a Star Trek stamp as well or a. Or, you know, or, or a Star Wars stamp or whatever it might be. The basket of goods is that much higher. They're not as valuable to us as our, our core base. And we look after our core base and they're, they, you know, they're worth, the, they're worth in gold to us. But, um, you know, the new people probably only going to buy something once, but it, that's where the new money is. And on the back of that, a, 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 a business that was supposed to be making half the money it was within 10 and gone within 10 years is now incredibly stable and actually probably making more rather than less sometimes we grow sometimes but so we've we, so we've done that by looking at things very very differently um thank you Matthew. I, I think uh, that, i think indeed it's a very very nice uh, uh impressive impact on all those philately business and, and and your audience for sure uh, Walter, if you have any question to share before we check the assistance. Yes, 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 of course. Well, I, uh, I loved listening to Matthew. Um, I, I love his, his drive and um, his, his powerful statements. Um, we, we have a certain angle here uh, for the wider postal sector player to, to help designated operators um, in their mission. Um, to um, to get back into um, the same kind of motivated environment we we saw Matthew acting in. So so let me place a very direct question: How sure. can designated operators who do not necessarily have the same resources as Royal Mail and um, created the same kind of success stories already um, replicate? Uh, your success uh, with brands. I think it's 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 it, 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 it. You don't have to spend a lot of money 
it's more about time and effort, I would say. And, and you know, you may think Royal Mail have enormous resources. We really don't in Stone's <laughs> but 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 I, I, it, it's it's showing willing. It's 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 getting known. I think. So what's happened with us? Um, and, and Transformers is a good example of this. So, I'd say six or seven years ago, we went to um, brand licensing show. We go every year, and that's where you, you you need to kind of meet up and have meetings and things like that. But some of the bigger stands, you can't get in the door unless unless they know who you are you know so and i remember sitting outside walking past the hasbro stand um like eight seven eight years ago saying to uh stuart who, who's my head of licensing one day we're going to get a meeting on that stand and one day we're going to do transformer stands and we did it but how did we do it we did it by doing the right deals initially and treating them in such a way that the world saw it we then won so we won licensing awards we won one for harry potter we won one for star wars we, we won a few over the time and within the licensing industry then the then that turned into people came to us and people now come to us and will say look we'd like to try this as well and, and you know you'll walk into the licensing show now and people will be displaying the products that we did with them you know so you so say we've kind of gone from trying to get in the door to people kind of coming to us and it, and it it comes from 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 having a track record. It comes from from doing it, you know. I uh, um, so so I think I, I but but you do need to. It's really important to be able to explain what the benefit is. So my story at the beginning there about um, about the the Olympics. Yeah, I've told that story in many license or meetings when I've gone to see licensors because it's really important. You know, Kathleen Kennedy um, had a framed set of stamps on her wall. Uh, in her office at Lucasfilm, you know, the, the the talent will just do stuff because the talent just get excited because they're on a stamp, particularly American talent, because they love the fact that it's a British monarch in, in, in our case, you know, and some others have that too, others have, have, have different, but it's just that sort of that kudos of being on a stamp. Daisy Ridley from Star Wars, when her first magazine interview, she spent half the article talking about the fact she was going to be on a stamp. You know, you do, you, you do get this. So you try and leverage that by... By by making by by engaging with the talent, actually, it's sometimes surprising how much they do get engaged. Um, but it is really important to have those meetings and where you can have meetings face to face. So go to licensing shows, go to whatever's in your country, go to the Las Vegas one if you can afford it. Um, uh, but but or or get your bus to sign it off if if you will. But but which I've yet yeah, not managed to do um, in this job. But um, also you know a, a, an example. Marvel Comics, um, I went to New York and sat in an office with Marvel Comics until they agreed to do a stamp. You know, I went to see DC Comics and met a whole load of them out there to explain what it is we could do. And, you know, it's it's it at the beginning, you do need to do that. Once you've done that two or three times, you've, you've built up a track record. So I wouldn't be afraid of that. I think, but I, th I think um, not, not every license or is as enlightened as Nicola and sees the benefit and would say, well, I'm not in it for the money. I think some licensors, it is fair to say there will, and I'm sure Nicola will appreciate this, there will be kind of a, a minimum level at which they're not going to get out of bed for. So you need to be aware of that. But I think it's 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 important to bear in mind that if, if you're going to do it, and, and music is just extraordinary. Music happened by accident. We did Pink Floyd and then we did David Bowie and suddenly um, it just became this huge opportunity and, and 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 most fans that we do they sell in 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 the levels of the um of the movies and all those kind of things they are our top tier and of course those bands love the fact that they're they're on stamps as well so so, so that is that is a category i would definitely recommend. thank you matthew i'm i'm sorry uh you are so passionate i'm sure you uh, <laughs> we can he listen to you for for uh, hours. i'd like to take the opportunities as i'm looking at the attendees uh, side to uh, also, uh, mm, allow me, Walter, to just check if there's any question from our attendees. I can recognize a lot of different names from a lot of different postal operators and, and, and CC members. Is, is If there is any question in this, from the attendees, please raise your hands. Walter, any other comment while we just check all the... Well, in, in the interest of time, um, Benjamin, I would like to um, go um, into the topic of uh, what the consultative committee is, is planning to do. 
to help designated operators in their efforts to do a similar success story. Uh, we heard already from New Zealand um, and also from the UK. So um, if you allow me to do that, Benjamin, I will use of course, of two course, minutes uh, of this precious time. So um, the General Assembly of the uh, Consultative Committee um, decided that uh, the Consultative Committee will invest into brand licensing services and uh, is aiming to build up um, a shared service center um, to um, exercise and to look into joint buying activities for top global, regional, and local brands licensing for the development of the business of uh, Philately. Um, I, think, I think this is a, a very timely approach. We can learn from uh, designated operators like Royal Mail and their success stories, and also from New Zealand Post. Our aim, of course, will be a clear focus on global brands. Um, to, to name some, uh, perhaps Walt Disney, perhaps the World Wildlife Fund, FIFA, of course, um, uh, the um, uh, Olympic movement and others, um, we, we are aiming um, to invest some of our um, money into that to improve the marketing reach, to um, have new and additional sales revenues for designated operators, to improve profitability, to find new collectors um, or uh, new interested people that are triggered um, by, um, by those, those initiatives. We need to learn more, obviously, from what we heard today from New Zealand uh, and Royal Mail. We, I understood that the national angle um, towards licensing uh, and to attract new interested parties, even through um, social media and, of course, on the World Wide Web, is extremely important. So, in a nutshell, um, we will uh, look into a shared service center for designated operators to help them um, to better understand brand licensing activities, intellectual property rights management, and to develop more merchandising, very much linked to uh, the current and future business uh, related to stamps and the philatelic business. And with that, back to you, Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you, Walter. I think that's al almost the, wo the, the, the word of the end. Uh, how, come, how come we can develop uh, on more than such a, a great news? Uh, allow me just uh, to, to feel thrilled by what you just announced. As the philatelic program manager for the Universal Postal Union, I, can, I cannot concur more th th than what you've said already. Just reminding everybody and all the attendees that stamps are the most collectible items in the world. We have here a tremendous vector of communication, which is counting billions, billions of, fig of uh, items traveling all over the world. And uh, I strongly believe that with the help of the CC and all the, 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 the designated operators, but not only, also some private company like uh, uh, Smiley and, and, and others, we can ensure a, a, a different uh, business angle and, and development angle for the future. So I'd like to thank all the, the, the experts and, and the, the chair of the CC committee for, for his time uh, today. Thank you, Nicolas, uh, for uh, taking the time to, to be with us and bring us a different vision. Uh, you are, I, I'd just like to highlight that you are not even a member of the CC committee, so it was uh, amazing for, uh, of you to take the time to, to, to share with all of us. And, um, and uh, I, I, I leave you the, the final word, Walter. Well, thank you very much. Um for all your efforts, Nicholas, Anthony, Matthew, uh, Benjamin. I think stamps and related products paired with brands and merchandising have a bright future. Let us work on it. Thank you very much indeed. Have a good day. Bye-bye.